Peace of the Lord be with you, my beloved Hope people. Our scripture tonight comes from the Gospel of Matthew, the sixth chapter. Hear these words from the book that we love, the bush that burns and is never consumed. Jesus says this to you, to me, to all of us. And whenever you pray, whenever you pray, do not heap up Do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners so that they may be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you are praying, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think they'll be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father sees in secret and knows what you need before you ask him. So pray then in this way. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors and do not bring us to the time of trial but rescue us from the evil one. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, neither will your Father forgive you your trespasses. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Prayer. Prayer. It's as basic as putting on your socks in the morning. It's as essential as putting oxygen into your lungs, through your blood. It's as fundamental to nourishment in the Christian life as food is to the body. There's nothing more fundamental or basic than prayer. If you want to grow in the Christian life, there is no way to do that without prayer. Because prayer puts us in a posture where we can listen. Prayer allows us to sit before a God and through Jesus allow that God to reform us, shape us, channel us, mold us, rebuke us, forgive us. Prayer is that place, my friends. So basic, so fundamental that it's easy to take for granted and therefore never think about it. How we pray, what to pray, who we pray to. Prayer is basic and it's also universal. All people at all times, everywhere, pray. All religious traditions are people of prayer. Christians have no corner on prayer. It's been said by people who know these things that there's no such thing as an atheist in a foxhole. At some point, in some place in your life, you're going to feel helpless, stuck, abandoned, and you will cry out. You may not even know who you're crying out to, but you will pray. All people pray. It is universal. But we don't all pray the same way. And that's one of the things that Jesus wants to teach us. All people pray, but Jesus wants to call us to pray differently, to be a particular kind of people of prayer. Last week we looked at how not to pray. Jesus says not to pray this way. Don't be like the Pharisees who love to stand in the synagogues and at the street corners to be seen by others. Don't pray in such a way that you're showy, you're showing off, or you use spirituality or coming to the gathering or to chapel in order to be seen by others, to use prayer as a mechanism to Prove your spirituality. Jesus says, don't do that. And then Jesus says this, don't be wordy. Don't go on and on and on and on thinking that if I pray a long time, I'll prove my worth to God. Jesus says, don't do that, for your Father in heaven knows what you need before you even ask him, which is a remarkable claim. Jesus says, don't be showy, don't be wordy. And then he says this, pray then in this way. The negative has a positive. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth, on earth, as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us to the time of trial, but rescue us from the evil one. Jesus says to pray this way. Don't be showy. Don't be wordy. Don't go on and on. But pray this particular prayer, what the church throughout time and space has called the Lord's Prayer. It is the Lord's Prayer that echoes down the canyons of time. It's been said by everyone who has picked up this book that we love. It is announced in every language on the earth. Wherever there's a group of people gathering in the name of Jesus, I guarantee you the Lord's Prayer, the Lord's Prayer will probably be on their lips. The Lord's Prayer is like Amish craftsmanship, simple, sturdy, and never goes out of style. We have to be careful. The Lord's Prayer, when Jesus says, pray then in this way, he's not inviting us to a new kind of Christian legalism, as if there's something particularly just magical about these words, that if we don't get these words exactly right, God won't hear us. That's not what Jesus is saying. He's using this as an invitation into a deeper life with God. Pray then in this way. Follow this pattern. Mine its depths and explore its treasures. Pray then in this way, Jesus says. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. The way that Jesus teaches us to pray as Christians, as followers of him, it begins with God. Prayer has a subject and it has an object. Prayer is fundamentally about God and it is fundamentally about addressing God in a particular way. And that way is personal. That way is an invitation to see yourself as a member of a family. With addressing God as a family member, we can say with confidence, our Father, our, not just mine, not just yours, but our Father, relocating our identity in a particular kind of family, a new kind of identity where we all belong together. The Lord's Prayer, all prayer, that it's Christian, hangs our status renewed in God. The fundamental thing that Jesus wants to teach us in the Lord's Prayer, I believe, is not how we pray, even what we pray, but has more to do with who we are praying to. It's not about how, but who. The Lord's Prayer hangs in the balance with its beginning. Everything follows from this. And if we get that wrong, we'll get prayer wrong. I think when Jesus says, pray then in this way, and he begins, our Father in heaven, everything that follow hangs on that claim of beginning our prayer as Christians with God. Now, why is that? Why, why is prayer fundamentally not about what, but who? I think the answer to that question has to do with Jesus' rebuke to the Pharisees and to the Gentiles, these pagans. Both people are praying. They're people of prayer. They're religious. They want to come before God. And Jesus says, don't do it this way. Don't do it this way because they have a fundamental misconception of who God is and their status and relationship before God. Jesus says, pray then in this way, our Father in heaven. Don't pray this way in such a way that you're showy, trying to be seen by others, heaping up empty words. Because if you're doing that, you probably have an idea of God whose love is conditional versus our Father whose love is unconditional. And that, my friends, is everything about prayer. If you are praying to a God whose love is conditional, it is not the Christian God. Our Father For a long time in my Christian life, I, I approached God, I think I prayed to God, not unlike how I was like on an athletic team. I thought of God as kind of this cosmic coach. 
And that if I played the game a certain way, if I was fit enough, if I was skilled enough, if I performed myself enough, if I proved myself enough, I'd have a spot on the roster. And if I didn't, I'd be cut. I'd be off the team. Condition, praying to a conditional God means that our identity before God is always in jeopardy. It's a contract grace. It is viewing God as like you have a business relationship, what I call an if-then God. If I do this, if I pray in a certain way, if I go to the right things, if I go on and on and pray to God, he'll see my sincerity, I'll prove myself, I'll perform well, and then God will give me what I need. Then God will listen to me. If I do this, God will do this. That's a contract. That's not grace. And that kind of God means that your identity is always in jeopardy. Jesus says, pray this way. Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Our Father. Our Father. Christian prayer is different because it begins with a different picture of God, a God that we're not having to perform for, a God we don't have to prove ourselves for, a God that we don't have to be perfect for. We pray to a God whose love is unconditional. Our Father who art in heaven. Jesus wants to show us that Christian prayer always begins with the Father's grace. We approach God in prayer by addressing not a God we perform for, but a God who we belong to as family members. Jesus wants us to see that our relationship to God is not conditional, but unconditional, that our status before God does not depend on our work but his work, that God listens to us, not based upon our performance and pleas, but based on the fact that God has made us his own, that we belong to him in body and soul and life and in death. Christian prayer begins by addressing our Father because God's grace is unconditional to all who call upon his name, his Son, our King, our Savior, Jesus. Jesus wants us to know that we don't have to pray in order to be heard by God, to perform for God. We just have to approach God humbly as his children. When the Lord's Prayer says, Our Father, it's an invitation to have a personal relationship with God. Praying our Father implies that God is not a, a force or an idea or a metaphor or a virtue, that God is a real reality who wants to be in relationship with us. Praying our Father implies that on the other end of the celestial telephone, there's not a what, but a who. Praying our Father means that God is not cut off from us, but is related to us in a particular way. For a Father is one who provides protects, and pursues his children. Our God, our Father, our Father, is one who provides and protects and pursues versus a conditional God where we have to perform, prove ourselves, and be perfect. Do you see the difference to approach God as our Father means that you are always free to just come and talk to him. I'm a young father right now. I have two, three, two kids. Two, yeah, two. <laughs> Sorry, Kristen. I have a three-year-old and a six-year-old, and I'm new at this game, and I make mistakes all the time, but I can tell you what, there's never a moment, there's never a moment that if one of my children just comes to me and says, Daddy, I don't listen. Not because of anything they've done do I listen, but because of who they are to me. They're my children. I love them. That's the point. That's the point, my friends, of why we pray this way, to approach God with that kind of confidence and intimacy. But it's not that easy. I know. They're, it's not that easy to always pray that way with that kind of confidence. I, I know. And many of you know. Because there, there's a problem sometimes that many of us face by the fact that that word father 
is impacted by the fathers we've had or that we've seen. The fathers on earth don't always measure up to the heavenly father ideals that we see in God. And for many, when I invite us to say our father, it trips you up, I know. Because your fathers were anything but loving. To pray our father can be frightening if one's father in real life has been abusive or emotionally distant. If one's earthly father was physically absent or was unfaithful or was verbally assaulting or just plain indifferent. And there's plenty of those stories to go around. Praying our father can create a kind of cognitive dissonance. How can I pray our Father when what I imagine is anything but that unconditional love? And that's a very good question. And so the antidote to that problem for many is just not to say our Father. Change the language. We can use creator. Explore a different metaphor. But I, and I understand that. I understand where that comes from, and I can enter into that, and I can listen to that. I really can But I wonder if there isn't something lost when we do that too. That when Jesus invites us to pray our Father, there may be a particular reason why. Maybe Jesus knows that we don't measure up. When we are invited to pray our Father, we're not invited to see God as a male sitting on a throne with a long white beard. That is not the point. God is not a male. God is not a female. God is all things. Male and female come through him and both share his divine image. When we're invited to pray our Father, I'm wondering if maybe Jesus is inviting all of us, all of us, male and female, to maybe reimagine a fundamental relationship with God. One where our identity is never in jeopardy. One where our status with God isn't based upon whether we're good enough to make the team. One where if we do something wrong, we're not cut or running lines, but embraced, forgiven, forgiven. It seems to me that the only condition to Praying our Father is that we be a people who forgive just as God has forgiven us. That is the heart of God the Father, a fundamental instinct to forgive each other. I think that it's significant that we pray our Father because it reframes our imaginations. It gives earthly fathers and mothers a picture of how to be a parent. If you have not had an earthly father who is present, look to your heavenly father. And by looking to God the Father, we learn that we have a father who is good, who is loving, who is for you in every way. Praying our father reconditions our expectations. Our father gives us a picture of a God who is personal, relational, not distant, not abstract. We'll go not one, not two, not three, but a hundred extra million miles for you. How do we know this? How can we make that kind of claim about God? Well, we can make that kind of claim about God because of what Jesus says about God. Jesus says this a chapter later about God, the Father. He says this, Ask and it will be given you. Search and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened. For everyone who asks receives and everyone who searches finds and for everyone who knocks the door will be opened. And this is the point. Is there anyone among you, anyone among you, who if your child asks for bread, you would give a stone? Or if your child asks for fish, you would give a snake? If you then, who are evil, sinful, know how to give good gifts to your child, how much more will your heavenly Father give good things to those who ask him? How do we know that God is loving? Because Jesus says that the heavenly Father is always about giving good things to his children. That doesn't make God a kind of cosmic Santa Claus just giving gifts out and presents out. It means that God is always providing for us in a way to sustain our life. We know that we can approach God our Father because Jesus teaches us that God is always giving good things to his children. 
He's always trying to invite us to reimagine God. One of my favorite pictures of that is in Luke 15 when Jesus tells a parable about God and the prodigal son. The son who took his inheritance from his father and went off into the far country, squandered his wealth, disregarded his identity until he hit rock bottom and realized that the only real place he belonged, the only place he'd have really experienced fundamental love was that father who he left. Jesus wants us to see God in a particular kind of way. He wants us to see God like that prodigal son, that when he came home and down that road into his into the country that was wide open, he saw the father pulling up his robe and running hard after him. That's the picture of the father. And we know that that's true because God has been the prodigal God who has ran after us. We know that God is loving, a protector, a provider, a pursuer, because when we see Jesus, we see God. To know who Jesus is, is to see the Father. And this is where the economy of the Trinity is really important. Every week we begin here at this candle. We begin in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I don't begin saying, hey, how are you? What's going on? No, we always begin with God's name. One God and three, three and one, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Because when you see the Father, you see the Son. And wherever there's a Son, there's also the Holy Spirit. If we want to know what it looks like to be a loving God, we look to Jesus because when we see Jesus, we see the Father. No one has ever seen God except the Son, and the Son has made him known to us all, and all who call upon his name will be saved. And what does this Son do? That Son is the one who goes into the far country of salvation to put on flesh, to meet us where we are in our own humanity, to take this humanity to the cross, that he would be the substitutionary sacrifice for you and for me and for all creation to take away the sin of the world. That's what our Father does. Our Father doesn't stay distantly away. Our Father is the one who pursues us, goes into the world so that we might have a new pathway to God, the Father. Our Father is prayed for by the one who brings us home to the Father. Jesus is the way to God the Father. And we pray that because Jesus teaches us to pray that. He teaches us to pray to our Father because he's the one who makes a path for us to be adopted into his family. A family where we no longer have to prove ourselves, where we no longer have to perform, where we no longer have to be perfect. We just have to come humbly like a child and say, our Father, Abba, Daddy. And sometimes that's just enough, my friends. I have an old friend from high school named Jennifer. I saw her last summer been a long time, but she was still the same. Jennifer was one whose life was never easy. Her dad split when she was a kid, and her mom raised her, then remarried, and then she got divorced, and then her mom suffered from cancer and died, all before high school. Jennifer basically raised herself, put herself through college, working odd jobs. She's doing fine, has her own family now. And when I saw her, I asked, you know, how did you carry all of this? And Jennifer said to me, I carried it because I know, I knew my heavenly father was carrying me. Because I could pray my father, she said, I knew I always belonged. I knew I wasn't ever alone. I knew I had a family. And that was enough, she said. That was enough. And it's enough for you, too. Jennifer's truth is our truth, that we belong. We have a family. And if we can pray our Father, it means no matter what circumstances you are in right now, you are never alone, and there is always a path to come home. 
I don't know where you're at tonight. I don't know if you're wandering far away. I imagine there is somebody here tonight who wants to come home and doesn't know if they can, doesn't know if this God will love them. You can come home tonight. Our Father is calling you home tonight. You don't have to be in the far country anymore because God has already gone in the far country and gotten you. To all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God. God has made it possible for you to be his children and to pray with all sincerity, our Father in heaven. You have been adopted into God's family with all its rights and privileges, and your inheritance is forever, and it is secured in the death and resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ. We are given now a large family. And my friends, that is what this table is all about. That's what tonight is all about. That you and I together in Christ, whenever we pray our Father, are relocated into a large family where we are not our own, but belong body and soul to our faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. God, thank you that you are our Father, that you've made it possible for us to come home, that you are a God who pursues us, provides for us, protects us in this world you so love. So come now as we come to your table knowing that you are the one who provides. We pray this in your name, Jesus Christ. Amen.